This is a very exciting show, the Second Amendment of Free Society. It's, it's important now. Maybe it's always been important, but it's going to be important, even more important in the future. And we have Avi Soifer, former dean of the William S. Richardson School of Law, and who teaches even today on constitutional law. That's has been his expertise for the past 200, 240 years. Okay. And uh, Peter Hoffenberg, who is a history person at UH Manoa, and uh, he's into history uh, for the past 10,000 years. Uh, welcome to the show, you guys. It's so nice to Thank see you. you. Aloha. Good to see you. Good to be here. So we're talking, we're talking about the Second Amendment, and I wonder if I could uh, tap Peter first on the history of it, um, you know, from the time the Constitution, well, from the time the amendments were passed. <laughs> it's not exactly the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, just a historical perspective on it. Okay? Sure, of course. And then, uh, Avi, I, I'm hoping you can correct me because my, my background, as you know, is uh, European history. So for your audience, um, my lens is how the founding fathers and Americans have reinterpreted what they thought was their European heritage. And I, I think this is important because the originalists today on the court are going back and researching documents from the 18th century. So if we're going to think about originalist argument, what was intended, I think we need to understand the inheritance that they had. So historically, it seems to be a couple of key questions. And, and Avi, if you can help us with the law for these. Okay. One is, ever since the first gun was created and out in public, there have been efforts to manage and limit guns, as in gun control. The 16th century British state had efforts because they worried about what would it mean for weaponry to be in the hands of people who may not have the, either the state or the public interest in mind. So that's the first thing. There's a long history of this debate. I'm sure everybody in the audience has enjoyed Romeo and Juliet. And you can distill Romeo and Juliet down into what should the prince do when two families are dueling? And what they're dueling with are the equivalent of guns today, right? They're in public, they're dueling, no particular interest is actually causing chaos. So one is, there's a very long history of this, particularly in the Western world. Secondly, uh, it really, to a great degree, historically comes down on your view of who should have guns. The European tradition, and we don't have exactly the same here, is the Europeans worried about aristocrats having weapons. Farmers and popular people could grab farm weapons, and I'm sure all of us, one way or another, have imagined what could be done with a farm weapon, all right? So we're talking about a particular class and social interest, right? Uh, the equivalent in America is the Southern Plantation Lords and their monopoly on coercion. So one would be long-term. Secondly is who has the right. And thirdly, uh, and Avi can definitely, and very importantly correct me and add here, is we have this great debate about what freedom is. <laughs> and we seem to, in the extreme, have a belief that freedom is you're entitled to do whatever you would like to do. And that's not really the tradition of freedom in most of the world. So let me stop there, and Avi can bring up the law. And I think also the audience knows that there are several very uh, public cases right now. So I'm okay, Avi, you know, they that. didn't have to have a Second Amendment. They didn't have to have it. They decided they would have it to ensure uh, that some people in the society would be entitled to carry guns. But the title question of the show is, is it necessary? or a free society? Does it help? Does it hinder? Interestingly, one of the arguments uh, fairly recently in the Supreme Court was, uh, hey, look, there are all these other countries that don't have the equivalent of the Second Amendment, and they're civilized. And it used to be sometimes the Supreme Court would worry about where our fundamental rights fit in the civilized world or the Anglo-American world that they said at one point. Well, we don't worry about that anymore. Uh, we're on our own. And we have not had this right it's an important thing to underscore. We have not had this right as individuals until 2008. The Supreme Court several times rejected the claim that there was a right to these arms, and it was only when Justice Scalia discovered, he thought, uh, history on his side in saying there is an individual right to bear arms. And it's interesting how little is actually said in the Second Amendment and what he did with it. So the Second Amendment says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, 
the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. So the Heller case, uh, carefully selected, uh, was a guy who was security guard, actually a security guard at a federal uh, judicial center building, the Thurgood Marshall building, which is ironic in itself. Uh, and he said, DC is a really dangerous place. And DC has a very strong uh, gun control law. And when I go home, I have to take my gun apart. I can't you know, have live ammunition in it. I can't even use it. And I'm nervous about my own security. So it was that case that got to the Supreme Court. And what I think is the key to the Scalia opinion for the court is to say the following about the text that you've now seen. The Second Amendment is naturally divided into two parts. It's prefatory clause and the operative clause. The former does not limit the latter dramatically, but rather announces a purpose, a purpose. So he didn't believe in natural law, uh, natural justice. That's why we had texts and why he claimed to be an originalist or a textualist. But here, naturally, it has two clauses, which is a remarkable thing to say. What does that mean? It naturally has two clauses. Anyway, what it meant was I can talk about the second part and not about the first part. Because the first part was about Malicious, and it was important to the Americans, former colonists who had, after all, uh, just come out of a war. And so they were concerned about malicious. And it is traditional, as uh, was said in passing, that cities and states regulated carrying guns. In fact, I want to quote from a Hawaii territorial, uh, pre territory, uh, the monarchy. Uh, so the monarchy had the following act to prevent the carrying of deadly weapons, which recognized the habit of carrying deadly weapons is dangerous to life and public peace. So they said in 1854 that we're going to have fines and imprisonment for any person not authorized by law who shall carry or be found armed with any bowie knife, sword cane, pistol, air gun, slung shot, or other deadly weapon. And that was continued in territorial time. So the history of laws regulating carrying, openly or concealed, is a history of saying no, only certain people, which they went on to say, soldiers and so on, uh, may be exempt. That's what the Hawaii law is right now. The Hawaii law is perhaps on the ropes because of a case out of New York, which is similar to what we have here. And the Supreme Court looks inclined, at least, uh, to strike it down. Now, what happened, just to fill in a little bit, and then we'll go back to Peter and to Jay. Uh, so that's a federal decision in 2008 in Heller. The question then was, does it apply to the states? And that's the argument about what's fundamental. In 2010, the Supreme Court, in a fractured decision, said, yes, it does apply to the states, uh, with different opinions as to why it applies to the states or whether this is like substantive due process, which the conservatives claim not to like. And Scalia said, yeah, it is substantive process, but I'll go along. Thomas, interestingly, said we should go back to the beginning, and it's the privileges or immunities part of the 14th Amendment, which has been a dead letter, basically, since 1873. So he would go off in that direction. In any event, they said it does apply to the states. So that's why our law and the laws of all the other states are in a way before the Supreme Court right now. Even in Heller, however, uh, the court recognized that some kinds of arms could not be carried. We're not covered by Heller. Uh, and secondly, that if you had a long-standing law against carrying arms, then that was presumptively legal. So we don't know what the court's going to do. But just to finish this, uh, Judge Bybee on the Ninth Circuit recently wrote, and they've been looking at this uh, for a number of years. So this is about uh, Hawaii. And the name of the case is Young. Uh, and he said, and he's someone who considers himself an historian, but he's also a very conservative guy. He is regarded as the main author of the torture memo during the George W. Bush administration. So he's no flaming liberal. He says, our review of more than 700 years of English and American legal history reveals a strong theme. Government has the power to regulate arms in the public square. History is messy. The record is not uniform, but this is the overwhelming evidence. I think that's right. I think Peter can fill that in and add to it. But does the court really care about the history? We shall see. Oh, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. I'm coming to your class for sure. I've always wanted to. Yep. So um, 
Jay, did you have another question or you want to? Oh, many, many questions, but okay. uh, Avi suggested you might want to, you know, get into this right now. Well, just very briefly, I, I obviously prefer and agree with Avi for a variety of reasons, including baseball. Uh, but I think today what we have, and um, contrary to what some of the justices would see, it really, it's hard to see a, an apolitical court. I don't know if there has ever been one, but right now it seems to be very difficult. And that's not to say partisan. It's to say, uh, picking up what Avi said, this court seems to be inclined towards American exceptionalism, exceptionalism about religion but, and about abortion. And I'm not saying right or wrong, but philosophically, the American experience with gun control is also exceptional in a couple of, I think, important ways. Um, the question of a militia made perfect sense in the late 18th, early 19th century when there was no standing army. Uh, there was still plenty of violence, not internally, with Native Americans and potentially with Canadians. So to have a militia, right, made sense, right? That, that made sense. Then at least two or three very important works by renowned historians have suggested that, let's also be honest about this, uh, that the Southern states, again, wanted the Second Amendment. They did not want African-American slaves armed. Uh, they didn't, there was no army to protect slavery until 1861 with the army in Northern Virginia, but weapons in the hands of slave owners and their allies were either one, a deterrent to rebellion, which everybody went to bed fearing, or two, a dramatic response. So when we talk about American exceptionalism, I think those are two we need to add. Most European kingdoms had standing armies, and so militias were not really relevant. You've seen what militias mean in the European tradition, they mean the arming of political extremists, all right? And secondly, and I don't think the court wants to really wrestle with this, Avi, you can correct me, is it is one more, at least partial legacy of slavery. Uh, at least that's what uh, two very well-respected authors who are American historians have written. But, you know, time, times have changed dramatically. And, and we are in times, you know, when I was a kid, I belonged to the NRA. And I took my Mossberg 22 out and, you know, I hate to admit this, shot little tiny animals and things. Okay. <laughs> but, I am now, but, but I'm now resigning, then, resigning oh. for this show. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a cane, it was a gun you had. <laughs> but, but, you know, the NRA has changed. They were you threatening queens. You were doing this in self defense. No, no, no. Right? This, was, this was up in the Catskills. Thank you very <laughs> yeah, much. I could see Jay as head of the militia. Yeah, he was. <laughs> But my point is the NRA has completely changed. And the people in and around the NRA, including the Russians, you know, have a whole new view of guns. Um, and, it is, and it's connected, you know, with uh, assault rifles. It's connected. It's political. Uh, it's Trump. Uh, it's a right-wing militia. To use militia in, in the, the, the common definition today, it's a lot different. Uh, than in revolutionary times, the word militia. Um, so we have a very dangerous situation on our hands because of the political environment in which we live. And, and I think we have to look at the Second Amendment in the context of that. I consider the Second Amendment a very dangerous part of our constitutional future. Don't you, Avi? Well, if the Second Amendment said what the court has said it said, maybe, but it's not, you can't blame the Second Amendment, you got to blame the court, I okay. think. And I've got to uh, emphasize that the Supreme Court of the United States several times had the opportunity to say it protects individual rights, and several times said, no, it doesn't. Uh, so what they did in 2008 was not following precedent at all. And it was really just saying, we don't care about that. We've now found something in the text, which I tried to suggest is not really in the text at all, nor is it in history or tradition or the usual things that you look to. So you have Parkland and you know dozens of other examples all in the last few years where it's obvious that we need more gun control. It's also obvious that the GOP is never in its present form, never gonna vote for any gun control. And it becomes um, you know, very dangerous for the citizen. That leaves it in the hands of the Supreme Court to reverse or modify Heller, to come up with a new approach uh, where the average person has greater security on the, on the streets of our country. 
Um, but this doesn't seem likely either. Where are we going, Avi? Well, yeah, I'm more optimistic than you as a general rule, but on this one, it's very hard to be optimistic. Uh, now, it may be the Supreme Court has a narrow decision. And that could be uh, for lots of reasons, including uh, that they, some of the most conservative and most recent justices want to kind of uh, keep their powder dry, as it were, uh, for another term or two before they really do much more damage. And I, th I personally think they're not going to overrule Roe versus Wade, for example. Uh, they're cutting away at it, as the court has been doing for decades. So they will cut away at it further. And I think that's not the Texas case. Uh, I think it's the Mississippi case. And they'll say, oh, it's an undue burden. No, it's not an undue burden. We hereby fine. So uh, the court has a lot of discretion, a lot of ways of kind of hiding what they're doing from the general public. And optimist that I may be, that's really tricky. Now, an argument about the vigilante part of the most recent Texas abortion law was, hey, if the state can do this and then say, oh, you can't sue us, you can't sue anyone in the state, the same thing could go on in a state that likes gun control. Uh, so they could say, well, private citizens can enforce this. So that for one little moment, the Second Amendment argument was actually useful uh, when Justice Kagan pinned down the Texas, uh, the Texas lawyer. But uh, let's hope. But I don't see now we have people and it's dramatic right now as we're watching uh, two jury trials uh, that people say self-defense. You know, you just say, OK, self-defense. And that's why I carried uh, from across state lines. I carried this gun, uh, an assault rifle. I needed that for self-defense, which is Rittenhouse, the Wisconsin case. We'll see what the oh, you know, he, he may be uh, acquitted. Yeah. It's a possibility at, at the moment. And, and what's troubling about that is there are people who. Mm, really won't like an acquittal. And that takes us back to the streets. Uh, and on the streets, there is um, a lack of gun control, I would say, um, that stands in the way of gun violence in the streets. So, you know, it, the whole thing is, um, it, it seems to be accelerating. I, I was telling you about an article, a blog in the, in the Vera Institute of Justice, where, this was in 2014, where they made an analysis of um, you know, why young people, uh, and maybe not so young people, uh, got involved in guns, got inv involved in violence. And what seems clear is that in our current environment, including the media, not only um, you know, entertainment media, which has plenty of violence with guns. I mean, you could count the number of guns you see every day, every day in so many movies and shows. It's ridiculous. It, and it doesn't. With, we, even with all the violence in the country, the amount in the media is, is, does not accurately portray <laughs> the reality either is so many guns. Um, but also it's, um, it's, the, it's the news itself, um, all, all parts of the news, which seems to extol the virtue of guns. And then of course, uh, the Vera Institute talked about what, what makes guns and violence so popular among young people and how they're attracted to it. It's a whole psychological process, including minimization um, of, of the violence uh, when you get hurt. Uh, and if you survive, uh, then the psychological you know, mechanism is to go back and do it yourself. The victim becomes the assailant. And so what we have in our modern society, thanks to the media and uh, other factors, I suppose, is an increase in the amount of violence. And guns are central in the amount of violence. Let me report to our audience that um, Peter Hoffenberg's internet went down and he is unable to join us. And so it's just, it's just Avi and me uh, right. to talk about, you know, I mean, this, this, is, this is more than just guns. It's the ability of, of the government as it stands to properly interpret the constitution and to, and to keep us safe, which is a fundamental obligation of government everywhere and anywhere, security. And so, you know, what does this tell us about the constitution in current times and the government's um, enforcement, is that the right word? The government's interpretation, uh, the government's de deployment of the constitution yeah. in current times. It's a larger question than just guns. Well, um, I haven't asked you to ask that or say that, but it does feed right into something that I've been working on for decades without any effect and I'm now trying to write about. 
And that is that there was such a notion of the government as protecting uh, the citizenry. And that was actually constitutionalized, wasn't it? With equal protection in the 14th Amendment. And the equal part is where we have spent all our time, really. And we've forgotten the protection part. But they were quite serious about the protection part. And in fact, they based the 14th Amendment largely on an 1866 Civil Rights Act, the first Civil Rights Act ever, which guaranteed, first of all, it declared that Blacks were citizens, other people too. But it said, OK, Blacks are citizens, former slaves, now you're citizens. And as citizens, you have the following rights. And it went through a long list and said, full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings. You are guaranteed that. You're guaranteed full as well as equal. So what does it mean to have full protection? And they listed some of the things, but they also had an idea correctly that there was a need for protection for former slaves. Because what happened in the South was somewhat foreseeable. It was worse than they thought. But of course, there was violence immediately aimed at former slaves and attempts to keep them in everything but slavery uh, not let them leave the plantations where they had been enslaved and so on. And that's what the 39th Congress was responding to, both in the statute I mentioned and in the 14th Amendment. And the court, it's scary to worry about protection because paternalism is a part of it and other things. And so we've just steered away from it almost completely. But if you go back to the point you made, Jay, why do we come into society from the jungle or the forest or wherever we came from? And John Locke, a very influential uh, theoretician, uh, but not high pollutant theory. He was read and understood, certainly by framers of the Constitution. He was a major factor, someone they read. Jefferson sent Madison John Locke so he'd be prepared for the Constitutional Convention. John Locke said, you come in for protection. That's why you enter society. And that makes some intuitive sense. So yes, the government is a correlative relationship, it said. And you have rights and duties, and they go together. And the state has some duties to protect you in your rights, which is actually what the 14th Amendment is largely about. And we talk about the First Amendment. Well, they have a duty to protect the freedom of expression, even if the crowd is hostile. They have a duty to protect the person who's pissed them off and make sure that the speaker doesn't get beaten up or killed or whatever. So it's a longstanding but overlooked part of what equal protection and what the 14th Amendment are about. Peters may be back. I'm sorry. Well, Avi, Avi and I were talking about the, um, you know, the protection part of the 14th Amendment and how you know, security is a really important part of government, that government should protect us. And I guess where I get stuck on that is what we were talking about originally. Um, does the 14th Amendment, I'm sorry, does the Second Amendment uh, provide a free society? Um, maybe then? because we didn't have, as, as Avi pointed out, a standing army, or, or Peter, you pointed that out. Um, and um, do we need it? Do we need the, the Second Amendment then? Do we need the Second Amendment now? It seems to me that protection against too many guns is more important now. We have a standing army for larger security issues. Uh, why do we need it at all? You know, the thing, the thing people always say when they talk about exceptionalism in this country is that this country has the ability to change with changing times. I would dispute that. I don't think we change fast enough. Uh, I don't think, for example, we've, um, we've been fast enough about infrastructure and all our infrastructure is old by decades, not just a, a few months. And the same thing with guns. Guns have, and violence has changed the country. It's made us less secure in our personal lives. Um, but we haven't changed in favor of greater protection. We've changed in favor of less protection. Is, is the government, is the interpretation of the Constitution uh, changing with changing times? Isn't there a complete disconnect on that, Avi? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the next question. But, but uh, Peter, Peter, I even invoked John Locke without you to correct me. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I would, uh, I would hardly correct you except on who the starting pitcher should be for game three. Otherwise, I defer to you. Um, but the do you, want to, do you want to pick up that one first? Sure. Sure. So the Constitution, of course, has changed in interpretation over time. And uh, to some extent, that's a good thing, right? Uh, so classically, and there are many places one could cite, but Earl Warren, 
for a unanimous court in Brown versus Board of Education said we can't turn the clock back. We have to recognize what segregation means in this society right now. And it has effects on hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. That was, I think, uh, a good decision. Now, you can argue that black teachers lost their jobs, which is true, and many other things. And it certainly set in motion Southern resistance, which we're still paying for in many ways. Nonetheless, a good decision. And I think he was a bit wrong about what you could have found in the history of the 14th Amendment, but it was complicated. And history is complicated. It's messy. As I quoted Judge Bybee as saying, history is messy. It doesn't give you the kind of security, the psychological reassurance of, oh, it's all in the text. We'll just look at what the words mean, which is kind of silly, actually, but it is where our current court tends to be. Peter. So I think a couple of obviously existentialist questions. Uh, you know, what, what is a free society? And I, I think other than the absolute extreme of anarchism, the understood uh, inclusion is uh, freedom in a safe society. So it seems to me, just as the comment at the uh, well of Congress yesterday about, you know, does the First Amendment cover an enemy video in which one person is clearly killing another? No, because that enemy and that expression, and Avi can correct me again, is equivalent to yelling fire in a crowded theater. You can tell that there will be a lack of safety as a consequence of that fear. It seems to me. That as, as Avi uh, suggested, all decisions have always been political. I think the problem now is that they are partisan. And we need to separate partisan from political. Make a political decision legally is to say, like, you know, Justice Brandeis, there is a social context to this. Times have changed. But clearly what has happened, and look at among many things about Trump being wrong, Trump was honest. I have appointed these justices. They are bound to my partisan view. And I think that's the problem. And so what many people recognize, a majority of Americans recognize, that there should be some gun control. It's like abortion, every single poll, right? So the question is whether a partisan minority can overtake a majority and lead to an unsafe society. I think the case, regardless of what you think about uh, Kyle, in Kenosha, what the prosecution said is really true. When you go to a place armed and throw yourself into an armed situation, you really cannot cry self-defense. And that's where I think the NRA argument really falls on its head. Increasing guns do not make us safe. You can't simply say that I have the freedom to then bring an AR-15 and make society unsafe. All right, so I, you know, we all, we all, most people want an open society. Most, not everybody, that's true. But I think we also want a safe society. So $64,000 question is, uh, does a 17-year-old with an AR-15, you know, make for a safe society, whether it's open or not? Well, let's talk about the future of the society just for a moment, Dobby. You know, some people think we're on the way to some kind of autocracy. And, and it isn't just Trump. It's the GOP, it's the mm -hmm. base, it's people who, you know, kind of like autocrats because autocrats can, quote, get things done, end quote. Um, so a free society may not be what we have, at least in the, in the current understanding of what that means uh, going forward. How does the Second Amendment work in a society that is less than the free society we have, uh, that is more like an autocracy? How does the Second Amendment work in that case? Oh. I, I think um, that you're pointing to the, uh, or underscoring the, what Peter just said, which is if you start arming people, then other people are going to get armed. And this gets back to the Vera Institute study you were talking about uh, before. Uh, that happens to be true and has been recognized for a long, long time and isn't recognized in most countries. Uh, we have a Wild West mythology, uh, and uh, it's hard to get over our mythology. On the other hand, uh, also, as Peter said, you poll Americans and they are in favor of reasonable gun control. And Heller 
allowed for reasonable gun control. The court hasn't taken a gun case, so they've certainly been asked to for more than a decade. So that's what's really worrisome about this New York case and the fact that the court took it uh, because they don't care about the popular majority. And indeed, uh, for good and ill, the court has often stood up to the majority. It's mm -hmm. called the counter-majoritarian problem by Alex Bickle. This court is interventionist, activist all the time. Uh, and it seems on behalf of uh, certain agenda items that are high on the list uh, for those who appointed and confirmed them. Uh, so we have a real problem. Yeah, it's I think hard it's, to it's be highly, highly partisan. partisan. It's highly partisan. I, I, I don't know if you heard it, but uh, yeah. my, my uh, sister-in-law, uh, Linda Greenhouse, was on uh, Terry Gross Fresh Air uh, a week or two ago, and she talked about the court in general. And one of the questions that came up I'd like to ask you guys about is this. Um, is, is the court uh, sensitive, and this goes to what you were just saying, Avi, to public opinion in general? Or does it wall itself off from that and, and take the partisan approach because that's what put them on the bench, essentially, or that's what they are. Um, but should the court be um, sensitive to public opinion? Because it, it, it seems terribly wrong looking down the pike that the court won't care, doesn't care. This was discussed on, a, on you know, the Terry Gross uh, Fresh Air show. Um, it, it's, it's troublesome to think the court doesn't care about public opinion and would go the other way uh, and would leave, leave most of us in, in the lurch. Um, I know there's nothing we can do about that, except maybe pack the court, maybe. Um, but, you know, right now, it seems to me that they're, they're not very sensitive. Should they be more sensitive? What would you tell them to do? You go first, Peter. Okay, so I will go <laughs> as the uh, poorly in informed citizen and then turn to the, to the expert. I think there's still some value from Montesquieu of having an independent judiciary as much as possible. And that means, uh, sure, you stick one finger out the window, but again, one finger out the window in light of the larger issues we've been talking about. Uh, a free and open society as much as, as, much as possible, honoring as much as possible uh, the foundation principle, meaning that you don't bring ideology into it unless Bobby can correct me here, unless really the Senate is allowed to ask about those questions. I mean, part of the difficulty, I think, when you're answering a question about the public is we all knew that this would happen, both those who asked for it and those who did not ask for it. But the Senate would not allow it to be discussed. I think previous decisions should be discussed. Previous views should be discussed. The court has to be somewhat insulated. I think you can see from particularly Breyer's recent book tour, he's very sensitive about this issue. <laughs> um, but I also think unless you're gonna sequester judges like a jury, it, it's impossible. So uh, I think though the final point is the sense of the public needs to be more open. What I find with this court is yes, each side says it's in the public interest, but each side is appealing to the silo view of their own public interest. And that's really, I think, a fundamental problem in this country. There's no consensus about public. Your well, advice, Avi? Well, I, I can give examples, I think, on both sides of uh, this issue because we want the court to pay attention, but sometimes uh, we want them to be independent. And so let me talk about a couple of cases uh, from the same period. So uh, when, Gun when Dunkirk occurred is when the Supreme Court handed down its first decision about mandatory flag salute in the public schools. And Frankfurter wrote for the court and they said, yes, it's okay. That's the need for patriotism. Just a few years later, when the war, World War II was still going on, one of the best essays of all time written by Justice Roberts, sorry, by Justice Jackson, uh, is about the importance of not forcing what seems to be orthodoxy. Patriotism was still important. Now, maybe it looked better at that point. But Korematsu came down at the same time. And Korematsu said, we're basically not going to look at it. We're not racist. We're just going to uphold internment because of national security. That's what the experts say. So what did the public want in those three situations? Well, in the first one, I think they clearly wanted 
Jehovah's Witnesses not to be protected. And horrible things happened to Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of violence of a really egregious sort. So was the court paying attention to the violence? Was it paying attention to the war? Uh, when Korematsu came down, people really knew that national security was not an issue. Uh, there's a big fight in the Justice Department as to whether to drop a footnote in a brief that said that. And I actually talked to someone who was clerking on the Supreme Court at that time. He said, we all knew, but they didn't think they could say it because the war was still going on. And then comes uh, the Trump travel ban, which looked a lot like Korematsu in some ways. And the court just said, this isn't Korematsu. Korematsu has been overruled morally, so we don't have to overrule it legally. This isn't Korematsu. Or was it or wasn't it uh, with, the, with the travel ban? And Hawaii, of course, played an important role in providing standing and that challenge. Ultimately, the travel ban that was upheld was not nearly as bad as the first one, but was still pretty bad in the name of national security. And who knows where the public was if you had put it to a, a poll or that a vote. You, thank you for opening up a very important Pandora's box, which is what is, is done during wartime. Governor Lincoln, of course, suspended habeas corpus. And one of the problems with our constitutional system, which has generated hundreds and hundreds of constitutions, is it's not an organic system. So in Britain, for example, wartime measures can be more easily overturned than here. And I think that's that's a fundamental problem of having a single document. We're, we're really among the first to do it. Uh, but Avi, you're talking about very important cases in which uh, allegedly there were national security interests. So should those national security interests though have a clock on them? Should a wartime measure, you know, after the war is formally uh, over, and we know wars do continue, but at least the states are fighting, uh, it would be an interesting constitutional question whether you know, that expires. So, well, let me return to the Second Amendment for a minute. Um, we have no war. Um, the abiding concern is the, is, is the security of um, kids in high school, of toddlers in Sandy Hook. Um, and I have to interrupt you just for a second, just for a second, because you and Avi and I agree with that, but the other side has not. And that's, that's the issue. For them, it is a war. And they look at this as a War. I so, understand. I, I, I know, but that, that culturally, I think that we got to at least recognize that uh, for them, the other side, uh, this is a battle. And okay, why should me, not, why should they not be it hard? from World War II then? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Avi, my question to you is uh, here you are, a constitutional lawyer who's been thinking about reading these cases, interpreting you know, the Constitution and the cases for a lifetime. And uh, if you were in a room with those guys right now um, to talk about their sensitivity to uh, American values, their sensitivity to the future of the country, uh, their sensitivity to you know, public opinion, what would you advise them? What would you say to them? What would you advocate for in terms of their um, interpretation of the Second Amendment going forward? Well, one thing I would say, and it gets back to my point about what Scalia did to the Second Amendment text, is you really should look at the text, but you have to be honest about it. Uh, and you look at the text in the context of context, uh, not just because you look at five dictionaries. And they, they are making a parody of looking at the text now and talking about syntax and telling us about the difference between adjectival and uh, adverbial and so on. That doesn't capture why we care about the text, but the text doesn't answer the questions. There's a great saying uh, by the founder of uh, Reconstruction Judaism, Mordechai Kaplan, and he said, the past has a vote, but it doesn't have a veto. <laughs> I think that's right. I think that's important, but I think that doesn't mean we ignore the text. And I've just finished uh, co-authoring an article, which went up on SSRN today, I think, uh, which is about section two of the 14th amendment. And other people in my co-authors know a lot more about it than I do, but section two was saying, if a state interferes with the vote, they get their electoral college representation reduced. Now this was in the context of the civil war, hasn't been invoked for a long, long time, but it sits there It's an interesting and important text, which might keep us from state legislatures doing what they are now doing, which is to say, 
we don't care what the vote was in the state. We, the legislature, get to select the Electoral College representatives. Well, they don't. I mean, they want to. They have political clout. In some states, they have the majority for sure. But at least this text is a, a speed bump, if you will. You know, I, I can't help but uh, tell you my original reaction when I went and looked at the text of the Second Amendment, uh, which we had on the screen. Can we put that back on the screen for one more minute? Yeah. My first reaction, Avi and Peter, was, you know, <clears throat> if um, you took this problem and you referred it to a first-year law student at the William S. Richardson School of Law, they could have drafted it better. It is... <laughs> It is, in my view, not well drafted. If we could only go back there now and talk to those people. You agree, Avi? I mean, you're talking about looking at syntax and all that. It's not well drafted. Sorry. That, that's true. And one of the things one learns in constitutional law uh, quickly, I guess, is that at times there was what's been called purposeful ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that's true of the Second Amendment, actually. I don't think it's so ambiguous, but other parts of the Constitution clearly were compromised parts. Okay, Peter, it's time for you to summarize and thank Avi for coming down today. Well, first of all, my apologies for the Zoom mishap, but Avi, thank you very much for once again, as always, uh, providing insight uh, and also more than insight, uh, your own personal analysis and touch, which I think is really appreciated. You're, you're one of the jewels of our community. So thank you very much. Uh, Jay, as always, he came up with a good question, so I look forward to what we're going to discuss in two, two weeks. Um, I don't know if we've answered anything, uh, but I think we've, uh, if nothing else, going back to the title of the show, we've said history can help, but only so much. And I think we're once again at that situation that we have to be honest with how we use the past. I think that's <laughs> the takeaway. Don't, you will, don't use the past as a cudgel. Um, if you will, constitutional law can help. But only so much. So much. And I, I guess if anybody and if any of my students are listening, watch where you put your commas. Be very careful about your commas. Oh, uh, that They'll Oxford come, comma, right? Yes, they will come back to bite you in our collective talk. Yep. We are unanimous on that point. All right. Thank you, Avi. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. Of course. Bye. Everybody be well. Take